Now we come to the temporal bone. This bone is a challenge to describe. It is not flat like the parietal bone. It is certainly not featureless like the parietal bone. It has many features, and in many ways it's a very important bone. So you can say a lot about the temporal bone. What I'll do is I'll produce two videos on the temporal bone. One, this one, will be the short version and I'll just go through the key features of this bone and describe them as you might see them described in your basic anatomy text. In another version of this video, an extended version, I'll go into greater detail of all the interesting things you can find in the temporal bone. So let's first begin by stating that this is an irregular bone that you can divide into three major portions. One portion is called the squamous portion. As the name suggests, this portion is flat, like a scale. And it is going to form the lateral wall of the cranium and articulate with the sphenoid, the parietal, and the occipital bones. It will also contain a process that extends first laterally and then curves anteriorly, the zygomatic process. And the zygomatic process is going to join with the temporal process of the zygomatic bone to give you the zygomatic arch. But this arch is also going to have an important articulation. If you discount the ear ossicles, this is the only place where you're going to see a movable articulation in the skull, the temporomandibular joint. So you're going to find, associated with the zygomatic arch, you're going to find the mandibular fossa, which is going to be the temporal component of the temporomandibular joint. It's going to articulate with the condyloid process of the mandible. Anterior to this fossa, you're going to see a swelling or an enlargement, which is referred to as the articular tubercle. And here is an inferior view of the skull with the mandible removed. And you can see here is the mandibular fossa. And anterior to it, you can see this enlarged raised area, which is referred to as the articular tubercle. Immediately posterior and lateral to the zygomatic process, you'll find the tympanic part of the temporal bone. This part is basically going to form the wall of the external ear canal, the external auditory meatus. So it's a relatively small part, but it is an important part because it is associated with your sense of hearing. The third part, in most basic anatomy texts, is the petrous part. The word petrous comes from a word which means stone. And you can interpret the meaning of this name as applying to the density of the bone. You could also apply the significance of this name to the shape of this part, which is kind of like a pebble, if you will, a rock. Whatever, the word petrus refers to its stone-like quality. Inferior to the external auditory meatus, a process of the petrus part is called the mastoid process. Mastoid means breast-like. Other words that have this stem are mastectomy, which is removal of the breasts, uh, mastoiditis, which is something that you talk about when cows, for example, get udder infections. And so I imagine that it's called the mastoid process because the anatomist looked at this process and it occurred to him that it looked like a breast. Now, whether he thought it was a female breast or something else, I don't know, but we can only imagine. If you look at the mastoid process from below, you'll find associated with the foramen, the mastoid foramen. Anterior to the mastoid process, you'll find a slender process, which is referred to as the styloid process. This word styloid comes from its resemblance to a stake or a spine. You could also think of stylus, for example, anything long and slender. <laughs> 
The styloid process is an important process because it is the attachment for a number of important muscles that control the tongue, the larynx, the pharynx, and you have ligaments that attach to the hyoid bone. So uh, this, this process is doing quite a few things in terms of it serving as an attachment point. Between the styloid process and the mastoid process, there is an important foramen, which is called the stylomastoid foramen. This is a process that allows the seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve, to exit from the cranium on its way to the muscles of the face. Medially to the styloid process, there is a dished out region, a depression, which is the jugular fossa. The jugular fossa is going to join with the occipital notch to give you the jugular foramen. And the jugular foramen is an important exit point for a number of cranial nerves. And it is also, as the name implies, the place where the internal jugular vein exits from the cranium. Slightly medial to the jugular foramen or the jugular fossa, you're going to find the opening to the carotid canal. And the carotid canal is an important feature because it allows for the passage of the internal carotid artery to, to the brain. And the internal carotid arteries are important arteries that supply blood to the brain. Anterior and medial to the carotid canal, you'll see an opening which is referred to as the foramen lacerum. And you can translate the foramen lacerum into jagged opening. You can think of laceration, for example, which is a, a jagged cut. This is not an important opening because in the, the living skull, it is covered by hyaline cartilage. And the only reason it has a name is when you look at a skull like, like this, you'll see an opening and anatomists will name everything they can see. And it's obviously you can't ignore this opening, even though it's not really that important. And it'll look different in different skulls. And it's also not within the temporal bone. It is between the temporal bone and the occipital bone. So if you're looking at an isolated temporal bone, you're not going to really notice it. Another feature that I will not look at in great detail because it's hard to see is the auditory tube, which is also known as the eustachian tube. This is a tube that's going to connect the pharynx to the middle ear cavity, the tympanic cavity. Within the tympanic cavity, you're going to find the ear ossicles, which we'll talk about in greater detail when we get to the sensory system. Clinically, this is an important opening, the auditory tube, because if you have an upper respiratory infection, this is a way that the infection can travel from your throat to your middle ear cavity. And this happens particularly in young children because of the nature of the development of the auditory tube. It is somewhat horizontal in young children. And the infection, when it gets to the middle ear, you have a middle ear infection. The, the infection can then potentially infiltrate into the mastoid process and cause a mastoiditis. And a mastoiditis is a, a serious concern because the next place the infection can travel to is the, the meninges of the brain, and then you get a meningitis, and then if potentially an encephalitis. So this is why when young children get middle ear infections, the pediatrician will uh, treat that infection very aggressively. Finally, when we take a look at the petrous part of the temporal bone, there's an important opening which permits two nerves to enter, the seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve, and the eighth cranial nerve, the vestibulocochlear nerve. And so you can see this opening the, here. And this is what is called the in, internal acoustic meatus. Meatus is simply a fancy word for canal. And the, and the word acoustic can be substituted by auditory. So you can refer to this simply as the internal auditory canal. This brings to an end this short version of the video on the temporal bone.
If you would like to take a quiz, there is a link below in the description. And if you would like to view an extended version of this video, I provide a link to that extended version. It's about twice as long. Here are the image attributions. And also, I would like to introduce you to my assistant, Apollo.